Okay, welcome to Enumerative Combinatorics, lecture one. So two days ago was lecture zero, where we just talked administrative things. But now we're actually going to start talking about mathematics. Okay, we're going to start talking about enumerative combinatorics, which some people would say is the science of counting. Or some people might say that is the art of counting. It's, it certainly is very beautiful the way it works sometimes. So this is what we're going to learn this semester. Um, and uh, today I want to give you a little bit of a preview for the rest of the course. Um, so let's just get started. So let me first say two statements. First of all, enumerative combinatorics is about counting. OK, I already said this. So what, what do I mean by that? So the main question that we ask here is count the number of objects with certain given properties. This is uh, one of the main questions that's going to motivate everything that we do. Um, but very quickly, I want to make the point that enumerative combinatorics is not just about counting. Or rather, it cannot just be about counting. And what I mean by this is that we're going we're gonna to encounter a fact over and over again that in order to count objects, count the objects that we're trying to count, we often need to understand them first. Okay? And the issue here is that the objects that we're counting are not just simple numbers, one, two, three, four, the way that you learn to count when you were a kid. Uh, we're going to be counting sets that are maybe very unwieldy. Usually they're sets where you're going to have a very hard time trying to list all of them. And so you can't rely on that. And so you actually have to understand something about the objects to be able to count. I want to make that point clear that generally what we try to do is count things that you cannot just list and go one, two, three, etc. So what we need is shortcuts to understand their structure and be able to count them. Now, I said we need, we need to understand them first. But sometimes what happens is that it's not that we understand them first, it's that we understand them along the way as we try to count them. So often we will just understand them, their structure, along the way. And so even though sometimes the question that we ask might be count a certain uh, kind of object, we're not just interested in counting them, we're, we're interested in understanding them. And counting is, is part of understanding them and part of a way to, um, yeah, to, to get to understand them. So these are the two kind of main points that we will be revisiting over and over again. Okay? So... Most often, this takes the following uh, shape. We wish to count um, the objects in a set. Let's call it capital N for n equals 1, 2, 3, etc. Okay? So generally, it's actually going to be a family of problems that I'm going to study, such as, for example, what is, I mean, a simple example is what is the number of permutations of a set of n elements? Okay? So Sn could be the set of permutations of the numbers 1, 2, 3, up to n. And so I'm interested in counting the objects in Sn for all of the values, n equals 1 n equals 2, n equals 3, etc. Okay? And so, let me call a n the size of the set. Okay? 
Um, and uh, so one kind of philosophical question that I want to address is, what is a satisfactory answer to this question? So what is a good answer? To the, to the problem of, of counting a set, okay. counting the elements of a set. Um, actually, th this is sometimes a matter of taste, and it's sometimes a matter of what you're trying to do. Okay. And we're going to see that there are several different kinds of answers that we are interested in. Um, and uh, But maybe before, before, okay, we're doing a lot of philosophy, let's actually talk about a concrete mathematical problem and just illustrate, it, illustrate what I want to say in this so while we talk philosophy here, here we're going to talk about a concrete example, which is the following. Let t sub n be the number of tilings of a 2 by n rectangle with pieces, where the pieces are going to be little two by one rectangles. So two by one rectangles. That for obvious reasons I'm going to call dominoes. Okay. Now these are kind of like dominoes except that they're not going to have numbers on them. So here what I mean by domino is just a two by one rectangle. Okay. Uh, so let's do an example. Maybe Here's a two by five rectangle, okay? And I'm interested in tiling this thing with dominoes, okay? Um, let's say that I'm really not very sharp this morning. I didn't have my coffee, and I'm just gonna start doing, without thinking, just, just gonna start tiling in some way. So let's say that I start by putting down a tile here, okay? That's a two by one rectangle, and then I put another one here. And then I try to continue, and I find, okay, that was really not very smart, right? I, so I can't just do this in any way, but it's not that hard to do it either. I'm sure you can all think of at least one tiling of, of this. Uh, I don't know which one you're thinking of, but just to pick one, let's do, for example, this tiling. Okay. So this is an example of the kind of tiling that I'm trying to count. Um, and so, for example, let's say that I want to compute a 4. Okay. So then what I need to do is, is look at what are all the possible tilings of the 2 by 4 rectangle. Okay. And uh, actually, this is small enough that we can do it by hand. Maybe you can just help me make sure that I don't miss anything. So there's one obvious tiling where you can just do this, right? And then you can use two verticals and then two horizontals, or you can use first a vertical, then two horizontals, then a vertical, or you could use vertical, sorry, uh, let's do two horizontals, and then a vertical, and a vertical. Uh, are there any other ones? There's one more, right, which is to make all the tiles horizontal. Okay. And if you think about it, you'll see that there's no other tilings, and so A4 is 5, because these are all the tilings of the 2 by 4 rank. Okay. This is already maybe a little bit tricky, and I want you to think, okay, now what if I asked you to find A sub 100? You certainly don't want to do this by hand, right? And so um, this is what we're trying to do. I'm asking you to compute uh, Tn, sorry, here I should have said T4, right? This is T4, and in general, uh, I'm interested in computing Tn for any value of n. So let's go back to the question, what is a good answer? What kind of answer am I looking for, uh, for what Tn is? So. I want to point out that there's at least 
four different kinds of answers that we're going to like. So one kind of answer is just to find an explicit formula. And that formula might be that tn is equals n squared, or it might be that tn is some summation over k equals something to something of something, any kind of expression where you just plug in the value of n and you get the answer. Okay, that's an explicit formula. Are we going to be happy with the explicit formula? Well, if the formula is simpler, we're going to be happier. If the formula is a horrible mess, then we're going to be unhappier. That's pretty uh, obvious. So, but this is one kind of uh, answer that we're interested in. Two, we might have a recurrence formula. And so what this tells us is uh, it's going to be a procedure that tells you how to compute Tn, assuming that you already computed all the previous ones. So it'll be a formula for T10 in, in terms of T9, T8, T7, etc. Every Tn is going to be expressed in terms of Tn minus 1, Tn minus 2, etc. This is a recurrence formula. Sometimes that's going to be a, a very good way of, of presenting the answer. The third kind of answer that we're interested in uh, and maybe this is a little bit less familiar, is to give a formula for the generating function. Now, some of you know what a generating function is, some of you don't know what a generating function is, and so we will, we will go over what that means. Okay? And sometimes we're going to be very happy with this kind of answer. And the other kind of answer that we're interested in is what's called an asymptotic formula. Okay. And uh, what is that about? Well, asymptotic means that maybe you don't care exactly about the exact number of uh, objects, but you care approximately how quickly this number grows. So asymptotic might mean that Tn is approximately, I don't know, 5 to the n. Maybe it's not exactly 5 to the n, but it kind of grows like 5 to the n, meaning that the limit of tn over 5 to the n is equal to 1. Okay? Or maybe it grows like a polynomial, or maybe it grows like a logarithm. It's, this is about figuring out how quickly this number grows with n. Okay? So this is, this is more, you, you can imagine that analysis is going to play an important role here. And this is another kind of formula that we're going to be interested in. So this is kind of some philosophical discussion. These are the four kinds of answers that we're going to be looking for generally in this class. And what I want to do is talk about all of them in this problem, and then we're going to decide which one you like best. Uh, and you might see that maybe there's no obvious answer as to which one is the best one. So let's talk about an explicit formula first. Now, often this is actually quite quite tricky to do, and uh, I'm going to show you an explicit formula. And uh, it might look like I got it from out of nowhere, but I prepared class and I thought about it hard and I discovered what the formula was and I'm going to present it to you now. But that doesn't mean that it was easy to guess. Okay. The formula looks like this. Tn is n choose 0 plus n minus 1 choose 1 plus n minus 2 choose 2 plus n minus 3, 3 choose 3. And you keep doing that until what? You see that the top number is getting smaller, the bottom number is getting bigger. And remember that a choose b is the number of ways of choosing b things out of a things, meaning that, this, that the number in the bottom should always be bigger than the number in the top for this to uh, be 0. So you're just going to keep doing this until the, this number becomes smaller than this one. 
So that's about n over 2, right? n minus floor of n over 2, choose floor of n over 2. OK? This is an explicit formula. If I ask you t sub 100, you just plug in n equals 100, and that's the formula. Do you like it? Some of you like it, some of you don't like it. So somebody over there was saying they like it. Why do you like it? I forget. I saw somebody going like this. You, was it you, Servando? <laughs> somebody must like it. I mean, I like it. Nobody likes it? It's OK, right? I mean, at least uh, you know, here's some tiling problem, and it seems kind of out of nowhere. And this is OK. This is the answer in terms of things we understand, binomial coefficients. By the way, I should say we're going to talk a lot more about binomial coefficients, and, and we're going to redefine what these things are. Etc. But for now, just remember that A choose B is the number of ways of choosing B out of A things. Why don't you like it? You don't like it. <laughs> well, for 100, that's going to be a lot of things to compute. For example, imagine plugging in N equals 100 to this formula. This is going to have 50 terms, and they're not small. So this is not really a fun formula to plug in. But it's a formula. It's explicit. Um, let me give you a proof. And again, I don't want you to be very impressed that this is very slick. Maybe you should be impressed, but don't think that this got out of nowhere. Yeah, I've thought about this. And it goes back from what I just erased here that says, you know, if you want to count things, you should understand them first. Okay? And so, you know, I prepared class and I thought, okay, you know, I need to understand what these things look like. And so then this is kind of an understanding that you can come to. You can say, okay. Actually. This isn't so much about the tilings. I mean, you can you can encode this without the picture of the tilings. The tilings are a fun. Uh, they're a fun pictorial way of doing the following thing. What I'm doing really is that I'm saying, okay, you know, either you put a vertical, or if I put a horizontal one, then I have to put a horizontal one right below it. Okay. And so when I start, either I start with a with one vertical one, or I start with two horizontal ones. Okay? And if you continue this reasoning, you'll see that actually this is just a sequence of one vertical, one vertical, two horizontal, one vertical, and, it, and any kind of tiling is going to look like that. It's a sequence of vertical, two horizontals, vertical, vertical, two horizontals, etc. So now what I want to do is just encode the width of each block. So this is a block of length one. This is a block of length one. This is, uh, so let's say width, okay? So width one, width one, width two, and width one, okay? What property do these numbers have? They should add up to five because this thing is supposed to be five long. And what other properties do they have? The, the boring property that they're either one or two. And that's it, right? If you choose any sequence of, of ones and twos, that add up to five, then you can make a tiling. Okay. And so I have a bijection. So my tilings of a two by n to the ways of writing n as a sum of ones and twos. Um, what's, a, what's a bijection? Remember, a bijection is just a one-to-one -one -to -one -to -one correspondence. For each tiling, you get a writing of n in this way, and for each way of writing n like this, you get a tiling. And that means that instead of counting tilings, I can count these things, which are a little bit, they just look a little bit easier. Okay? So that's my first step. Okay, so then I'm going to say that in and uh, let me let me go ahead and define uh, a word for you which is composition so a composition is just an ordered sum like I have here so a compositions of n into ones and twos
Okay. So Tn is the number of compositions of n into ones and twos. Okay. How many sum ends do you have? Well, it, it actually depends. Right. Here you have one plus one plus one plus one. You have four sum ends. Here you have only three sum ends. Here you have two sum ends. So the number of sum ends changes. Okay. But what I can do is I can say, okay, let's let's divide this set. Let's 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 group the compositions according to how many vertical blocks and how many horizontal blocks they have. Okay. Or how many ones and how many twos they have. So for example, if I were to do that here, then this guy is going to be in its own family. It has four vertical blocks. It's one plus one plus one plus one. And then these guys get grouped together. Oh, not these guys. These three get grouped together as having two vertical uh, and two horizontal. One plus one plus two, one plus two plus one, two plus one plus one. And then this guy is on its own. So I split my set into different groups, and now I'm going to need to count what happens in each group. Okay. So of course, if I want to sum of, you know, if, if I want to count all of them, then let me just take the sum over all the different groups. And what is each group going to look like? Is each group is going to be the number of compositions of n into Let's say I have k twos. So if I have k twos, then how many ones do I have? It should be n minus two k, right? Because these guys add up to two k. So if I want to add up to n, then I should have n minus two k ones. Okay. So in this case, k is zero here. K is one, and here K is two. Now, I have to sum over all possible values of K. And in principle, K could go from zero to N, but in reality, how, how big can K be? Well, if you want to fit K twos, then K should be at most N over two, which is what we're seeing here, actually. Here, this goes up to N over two. So this goes up to the floor of n over 2. OK? OK. So then, sum from k equals 0 to floor of n over 2. And then, how many compositions are there of n into k 2s and n minus 2 k 1s? Well, you just have a list of have k 2s. You have, so there's k twos. You have n minus two k ones, right? So in total, how many sum ends do you have? So you have k plus n minus two k. So you have n minus k sum ends. Okay. And what you have to do is, out of the n minus k sum ends, you're going to decide which ones are twos and which ones are ones. How do you decide that? Well, if you have n minus k sum ends, and you have to choose k of them to be equal to 2, then out of the n minus k possible sum ends, you just choose which positions are taken by each. And that's the proof. Okay. And, and again, let me, let me just say I'm going a little bit fast today because I want to introduce all of these things. And later we're going to go back to, to an argument like this and parse it a little bit more slowly. Okay. But I just want to give you an idea of, of what kind of argument we use here. Um, and again, you see that it's, it's basically by understanding the structure of the tilings that I'm able to give the exact formula. Without that structure, this would have been hopeless. Okay, okay so this is an example of an explicit form. Any questions about it? So maybe 
We're just going to do one by one. But we did this one. Um, now let's talk about a recurrence form. Actually, before I go to the recurrence form, you know, let me just point something out to you. This goes from k equals 0 to power of n over 2. How big is this number? That it's, actually, it's a little bit hard to know. Is it like as big as n squared? Is it like 2 to the n? How, how big is it? It's not obvious to know because it's a sum of a bunch of things. And so you know you, you actually have to think a little bit harder uh, to think about how quickly this number grows. This is something that's hard to see from this point of view. Somehow, if you were an analyst and you wanted to know just the rate of growth, this is actually not so useful until you do something else to it. Okay. And so this is where actually to get from here to an asymptotic formula is actually very hard. And so this is a one reason not to like this answer. I would say the reason to like this answer, the reason I like it, is a kind of an aesthetic reason. I think it's kind of nice. It's, you have this tiling problem, and it's expressed in terms of binomial coefficients, and the proof is kind of nice. So that's why I like it. But I have to recognize that it's very bad when it comes to uh, finding an asymptotic problem. So that's why we continue. And this is my point. An explicit formula sometimes is not, not good enough. So let's talk about a recurrence formula. So in a recurrence formula, what you have to do is tell me what the answer to the uh, to this problem is in terms of smaller problems. If you already knew the answer for all the tilings for size 2 by 1, 2 by 2, up to 2 by 99, what's the answer to the 2 by 100? So we can do the following thing. Does anybody see already how, what this recurrence should be? The Bonacci like? Why is that? In the case it's two smaller, and there's two ways to solve it. And then at least it's one smaller, there's only one way to solve it. So we're going to see that this sequence satisfies the same recurrence of the Fibonacci numbers. Tn is equal to t n minus 1 plus t n minus 2. Okay. Uh, if you saw that right away, that you're very smart, that's great. Um, it's not entirely obvious. How do we think about this? Well, there's kind of a, a general trick for how to do this. So this is the number of tilings of a 2 by n. Okay. And if you if you want to reduce it to a smaller problem, very often what you do is that you just think about, okay, well, what's, how does the problem, how does, what happens at the beginning? What happens at the, let's say at the left of the time? Let's analyze what happens at the very left, and then hopefully the rest is a subproblem. So what happens at the very left of the time? Well, at the very left, how does the tiling start? There's two options, right? So. Number. So one option is that you start with a vertical tile. Number of tilings that look like this. Where the first tile is vertical. Now, if I don't start with a vertical tile, then What happens? Well, I have to cover this cell somehow, and it's not with the vertical, which means that it must be a horizontal. Is that wide enough? It's a horizontal tile. That's how I cover this cell. But now, if I put this horizontal tile, the only way that I'm going to be able to not get stuck is by putting another horizontal tile here. And so that's what happens if I don't start with a vertical tile. 
then I have to start with two horizontal tiles. So the tiles are either of this kind or of, and, or of this kind, and they, they're only of one of the kinds, and so I just, can, I just need to sum the number of ways of doing this and the number of ways of doing this. But the beauty of this is that these are just subproblems. It's a smaller problem. Because how many ways are there of, compute, of completing this tiling? Well, I can just ignore the first cell, and the rest is a 2 by n minus 1. So how many ways are there of doing that? Well, that's precisely the answer for the 2 for the n minus 1 rectangle. And if I start with these two, then I can ignore what happens here, and I'm going to get a 2 by, n minus 2 by n minus 2 rectangle here. So I get this. Okay? And that's, so this is the proof. And remember this proof because this is a, you know, there's many problems that look different, but the idea is very similar. You, if you want to do some kind of recursion like this, you always think about what happens at the beginning or what happens at the end. And uh, often you're able to, to see that what happens is that you're reducing to smaller problems. Okay. Okay, so if I give you this, how are you going to count t sub 100? Well, it's actually doesn't work for every value of n, and it should be big enough that this makes sense, right? So this is only true for n greater than or equal to 2. If n is 1, you don't want to deal with t sub minus 1. So any t starting from the second one, you can get from the previous ones, but you have to start somewhere. Right? So you have to say, OK, what's t sub 0? Number of tilings of a 2 by 0 rectangle. This is one of these annoying philosophical things. Is if I want to tile something that doesn't exist, is it possible or is it not possible? Is there zero ways or is there one way? Well, sometimes we like to just avoid these philosophical questions and just skip. Let's go to T1. T1 is easy. What is the number of ways of tiling at 2 by 1? It's just 1, right? The way one is already a dominant. What about T2? T2 is, the, is, a, is a square, a 2 by 2 square, which you can tile by two horizontals or by two verticals. So what should T0 be? You know, you don't want to get philosophical if you just want to follow the mathematics. You should, you should see that it's convenient to define T0 equals 1. So that this recurrence makes sense for n equals 2 also. Okay. And often what we do is this, we just figure out what the number needs to be, and then we come up with some justification. Well, of course, there's of course t0 is 1, because if you have to tile an empty region, then there's one way to do it, which is not to do it. So that's not convincing. Well, now that the recurrence falls, it must be, it must be convincing. Okay. Um, and then you and then you go with the recurrence, right? So it starts 1, 1, 2, then the next one, 1 plus 2 is 3. The next one, 2 plus 3 is 5, which is this one. 3 plus 5 is 8, 13, and you recognize these numbers. Right? So, uh, t sub n is 1 is the Fibonacci number, except that it's just off by 1. Because the Fibonacci numbers are defined so that this is actually f1, this is f2, this is f3. And so, uh, Tn is equal to Fn plus 1, where Fn is the nth, or let's say Fk is the kth Fibonacci. Um, so this is something that will make you recognize what these numbers are, but this is the recurrence. Right? This, is, this is the recurrence formula that we are talking about. Um, let me ask you, do you, do you, if I ask you to compute t sub 100, do you prefer our previous formula or do you prefer this? No. 
Thank you. You can you can do. Let's say you have to do it by hand. If I ask you to do it by hand, which one is better? This. Do you trust yourself more adding or multiplying? If here you just have to add things, whereas in the other one you have to do all kinds of entries, case which are not so fun to compute by hand. If you were to do it by hand, this is a better formula. Well, from Alpha can handle both. Uh, maybe this is faster to type, but I don't know. They both have advantages and disadvantages. That's that's always the point. Always the point is that sometimes two answers have their different uh, advantages. Okay. But anyway, that's the recurrence formula. Okay. This one. So the recurrence formula, like I said, is something where you answer the question for n by reducing it to the answer of previous values. So let's talk about the next one, generating function. Now, since uh, since we've agreed that these numbers are essentially the Fibonacci numbers, then I'm going to ask you to allow me to, to now switch to just Fibonacci numbers. Same thing. So let's talk about the, the generating function for Fibonacci numbers. Okay, so generating function. Again, we're going to do it for the Fibonacci numbers. We satisfy this recursion, and the initial values for the Fibonacci numbers are F0 equals 0, F1 equals 1. So what is the generating function? Generating function for these things. For this sequence. Is the following thing. It's an infinite power series. The variable is going to be x. And the sequence is going to be uh, giving me the coefficients. Okay. So f0 x to the 0 plus f1 x to the 1 plus f2 x squared f3 x cubed. Okay. And again, these are numbers, right? So this is you know, 0 plus 1 x to the 1 plus 1 x to the 2 plus 2x cubed, plus 3x to the 4th, plus 5x to the 5th, 8x to the 6th, whatever that. The coefficients are the same relation numbers, and the exponents just go up. Okay? So if you've never seen this before, then this should seem kind of strange, because we were doing combinatorics, and now all of a sudden I wrote down as this infinite power series, which seems like it belongs more in an analysis class. But you know, as this happens often in mathematics, you don't really get to choose what field you work on. The fields end up running into each other. And, um, and here we're going to borrow at least some ideas from analysis. Now, if you, okay, so if, if you do analysis, then what's the first question that you should ask? It? Convergence, right? So does this converge? Does this, can I write this down? What's the radius of convergence, etc. Okay. So that's if I treated this as a function that you plug in x's into. And that's one thing that I could do. So let me say I could treat this as something that I plug in values. I could plug in real values, or I could plug in complex values, or whatever. So I, I could treat this as an, an, as an analytic function. Okay. 
I could, but I won't. At least in this class, we won't. I mean, it's, it's useful to do it, but for many of the things that we that we do in combinatorics, um, it's actually not necessary to, to bring in the full, the full power of analysis. Um, I'm going to treat it as a formal power six. So, and again, this is something that I'm going to go into more detail later on, but one way of thinking about this is that you're allowed to manipulate these things the way that you manipulate uh, power series algebraically, but you're not allowed to plug in values of x, which is, you would need analysis to do it. If I wanted to plug in x, I would need to check convergence. Um, sometimes people like to talk this call this formal power series is the same thing as a clothes line. It's really just a line where you hang your clothes after you wash them, right? So here's the clothes line, and then here's the first value, the shirt here. And then the next one is maybe pants. And then the next one is And so you just you just uh, you just think of this thing as just some other way of listing the sequence of zero, f one, f two, f three, etc. But we're mathematicians, and we're not just happy with hanging our clothes. We start doing algebraic operations. So we do allow ourselves. So we allow algebraic operations. usual algebraic operations. Okay. And uh, maybe the, the best way of explaining, I mean, uh, I can go with, I can go through a formal discussion of, of uh, what exactly we're doing here. What we're doing is, it belongs in a class in abstract algebra where you know, we're regarding this as an element of the ring of formal power series, and then we're, we're doing algebraic computations in the ring of formal power series. So if you're familiar with that, then that terminology, then that's what we're doing. Uh, but if you're not familiar with that, let me just show you how it works. It actually works very simply. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna start doing operations on this thing. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to use my recurrence. Now my recurrence doesn't say anything about f0. And actually f0 is 0, so I'm not even going to write it. f1 is 1, so I get x. Yeah. Can you remember to talk into the computer? Because you're talking into the mouse. Thank you. Um, yeah, so f1 is equal to 1, right? So then f1 times x is just going to be x, okay? Now what about f2? Well, I'm going to say that f2 is f1 plus f0. So instead of f2 x squared, I write f1 x squared and f0 x squared. So f2 is f1 plus f0. Now f3. Well, f3 is f2 plus f1. So let me write f3 as f2 and f1. And so on. Okay, so each one of these terms, I write it as the previous one and the next two previous ones. Continue. So these are the kinds of algebraic operations that I'm allowed to use in formal powers. And what I did is this kind of vertical thing, right? So f2 is f1 plus f0, f3 is f2 plus f1, and so on. 
But now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to read this thing horizontally. And actually this one is going to be a little easier, so let's do it first. So it's going to be this plus this. So let's postpone this one for a second. What is what is this one? Well, if you see, it's actually what I get if I multiply this one by x squared. x squared times this is exactly this. The powers just shift from x0 to x2, from x1 to x3, and so on. And so this thing is just x squared f of x. Okay. What about this one? Well, what's this? I forget this first guy. This is this times x, because f1 x times x is f1 x squared. This times x is this. This times x is this. And what about this one? Well, this one is 0, so I, I don't need this one. And so what I get is that this is x plus x f of x. So I get this equation. So my uh, algebraic, sorry, my recurrence relation turns into a relation that the generating function sets. And actually, um, this relation tells me what the power series is, what f of x is, right? I can, again, you're allowed to do algebraic operations as long as you don't try to plug in values of x. So what do I do? Well. Send this guy to this side, send this guy to this side, factor f of x, and you're going to get that f of x is equal to x over 1 minus x minus x. Okay. That's the generating function for the sequence. Okay. So let's think about this one. Do you like it? Is it useful? Um, especially if you like analysis, maybe, maybe this is a, some, something that you feel very at home doing. Uh, now, out of these three methods, again, let's think about it. What's the best way to find f of 100? Well, if you, if you, have, if you have computer software, I, I think the fastest thing is just plug this into whatever your favorite computer software is and ask it to give you the power series. This is a power series. So you just say, you know, expand around 0, and it'll give you a power series, and just look at the coefficient of x to the 100. And that coefficient is going to be the Fibonacci number 100. And so uh, this is another, um, yeah, so I, mean, I would say this is another very nice way of, of getting a handle on these coefficients. Formula for the generating function. Do you guys have any questions about this this formula? Now, part of an analysis class is to compute the to compute the power series of various functions. And so, if you take an analysis, then you know how to how to actually compute this power series and get formulas for the coefficients. So this is one advantage of, of having a generating function. It's not, it's not just uh, a, a gimmick. It's actually very useful to obtain uh, some of the other things. In particular, to obtain an explicit formula. So let's revisit number one now that we have number three.
Actually, let me. So the next thing I'm going to do is go from three back to one. But before I do that, I want to make a. I want to write something suggestive. What was f of x? f of x was the generating function for Fibonacci numbers, which are basically titles. So what I want to do is this. I want to write an equation that says titles. by fill in the blank tidings and I want to rewrite this in the following way vertical tile over 1 minus vertical tile minus vertical You're looking at me like, what the hell is he doing? And that's fair. I haven't told you what I'm doing. But hopefully at least it's a little bit intriguing. And it should show you that. And it will show you that as we get really good at computing things like this, we can, we can just write something like this. I say, well, you know, tilings, they have these in the composable pieces. What are the prime tilings? The prime tilings are this one and this one. And every other thing is just a combination of prime tilings. And when we get good at this, we're just going to be able to write this equation. No questions asked, no need for a proof. This is part of a theory that tells you an equation like this holds. And because an equation like this holds, it makes sense that this is like x, because it has, it has width 1, this has width 1, and this has width 2. And so we did this kind of in an ad hoc way, but we're going to see that it's part of a bigger theory. Um, OK. So. So that's kind of a, a suggestion for what's going to come next. Now let's go from 3 back to 1. Okay. So So this is the generating function for the Fibonacci numbers. And again, let me just write it like this. So this is the power series whose coefficients are Fibonacci. And now I want to think, because you'll, you'll remember that actually I kind of pulled this formula out of a hat. Like this was not, this took some cleverness and made, sometimes we don't want to be clever, sometimes we just want to have somebody else do the hard work for us. So have the, I think the recurrence was a little bit easier. So from, from that way, we want to get back to an explicit form. So let me give you a question which I'm not going to answer. And this is going to happen a lot in this class, that I'm going to just throw out questions that are very well suited for the forum. Okay. So here's a question for the forum. Here's a question for the forum. Uh, how do I get from this formula to the formula that I gave you for the times? It's possible to do it. Okay. So the way this works, I'm, I, I just put these questions and whoever gets excited and thinks about them, you put the answer on the forum, or you put your ideas on the forum, and if they can be incomplete, they can be wrong. There's no pleasure. There's no pressure. There's no grade, and uh, it's just a good way to kind of talk about things that we're not going to talk about in the class. But it is possible to get from this formula to the explicit formula that I gave. But the reason that I want to do that is that actually. If you, if you were in an analysis class, that's not what you would do. Uh, if you were in an analysis class, you would never see an expression like this. What would you do in an analysis class? How do you find the power series expansion of something like this? Or if you think about, you know, you're teaching 
calculus to your calculus students and you're asking them to uh, take the integral of this, for example. Any ideas? There's this whole thing called uh, partial fractions, remember it? So the partial fractions tell you that you can take this thing. And the problem is that this thing is quadratic. And we don't really like quadratic in the denominator. But there's a way of, of dealing with that, which is that you can always write this in the following form. Partial fractions. Constants over linear things. Because the degree of this is smaller than the degree of this, then you can do this. Remember, how do you find these factors? 1 minus alpha x and 1 minus beta x are the factors that should give you this thing. So you just take this guy, you factor it into linear terms, and you write it like this. So this is partial fractions. It's a little bit different from partial fractions, the way that they're usually done, but uh, pretty much the same thing. Um, it would be kind of torturous, both for me and for you, to carry out this computation in front of you guys. You know how to do this. Maybe it's been a while, so you should just go ahead and do it. This is something else that you can do in the forum. So just for the forum, and somebody should actually complete this computation and find what the numbers are. And if you don't know how to do it, then you should learn, and actually in the homework you're going to need to do it. So, uh, And so I very much encourage you to discuss this one in the forum, because in the homework there's a very similar problem. You can find what these numbers are. So alpha is 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. Beta is 1 minus square root of 5 over 2. A is 1 over square root of 5. And B is minus 1 over. Okay. So this should start looking a little bit familiar. Um, if if I ask you, how do you go from combinatorics to this, it's very strange. But it's not strange to get square roots when you're solving quadratic equations. So there's a, there's a very natural place where this comes. These are just coming from, the, from this quadratic equation. OK, so what's the advantage of this? The advantage is that maybe we didn't know right away what this power series was. But this one is very easy, because A is just a constant. And what's the power series for 1 over 1 minus something? Just a standard um, geometric series. So let's write it down. This geometric series gives me this. Right? 1 over 1 minus alpha x is the sum of alpha to the n x to the n. This one gives me sum and greater than or equal to 0, beta to the n, x to the n. Okay. And so what you get is that the coefficient of x to the n is a alpha to the n plus b beta to the n. Which is fantastic because that coefficient is precisely the Fibonacci number that we're trying to compute. Okay, so what do we get? We get the familiar formula that the nth Fibonacci number is just plugging in these numbers, right? So 1 over square root of 5. 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 to the n minus 1 minus square root of 5 over 2 to 
the end. Okay. Which is an explicit formula. Now, what do you think about this explicit formula? I hope that by now you've learned to love this formula. I think any mathematician, when they first see this, and we're young and we don't know a lot of mathematics, this might even be a little bit scary. But then you come to really embrace it. This is a very beautiful formula. And the, I mean, the fact is that that's what the Fibonacci numbers are, right? Um, do you want to compute F sub 100 using this? I mean, you definitely don't want to think about computing 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 to the 100 by hand. Do you think your calculator will get it right? Well, is this, is this uh, I don't know, some number raised to the power of 100. Uh, you've seen from your students that calculators don't work as well as they think mm -hmm. they do. And so we should be cautious ourselves also. Maybe if you plug in your calculator, it's going to give you something that's a little bit off, if n is really big. Okay. So again, this is not really the best way to actually compute f sub 100. But it's an explicit form. Okay. And so again, the point is that generating functions are not only a, a cute closed line. They're actually a very useful tool to give you a formula that I would argue, in a lot of ways, is better than the first formula that I gave. The first one is maybe a little bit cleaner in that it only has binomial coefficients, but, uh, it, but this one is clearly more explicit. Right? It's, not a, it's not a sum of n things, it's a sum of two things. Okay, finally, so again, remember to do this in the form. Carry this computation out. So it will also be a good, good practice for your LaTeX skills. Make sure that you close every parenthesis that you open. And, uh, okay. So what about number four? What about asymptotic formula? How big is the n Fibonacci number, approximately? In analysis language, what is f n asymptotic to? You want to put something here so that the limit of this divided by this is 1. So what is it? Actually, this, this tells you what it is. I mean, you have two sum ends, right? So you know it's this plus this. So the question is, are these numbers big or are they small? So what, what are they? Are they big or are they small? You remember how much 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 is? The golden ratio? What is it? 1.618. 1. 1. 1.618 to the n. It's big. It's exponential, right? a constant to the end. What about this one? Yeah, it's minus 0.618. Mm -hmm. How much is minus 0.618 to the end? It's tiny, right? You're taking a number that's smaller than 1 in absolute value and raising it to the end. So for n really big, this is irrelevant. It's not there. Actually, you might as, if you're going to use your calculator, you might as well just plug in this, because this is going to be 0, according to the calculator. And so this is asymptotically 1 over square root of 5 times the golden ratio to the n. And again, remember that when I write this, it means I mean that the limit as n goes to infinity of fn over g. And I've explained how the answer to my tiling problem asymptotically grows like one of these very basic functions that we teach in pre calculus. It's just an exponential uh, function. It couldn't get simpler than this. And that gives me the asymptotic form. 
and you should realize that we owe that asymptotic formula to the generating function. That's where it comes from. We, and this will show you how hard it would have been to get it from the first formula with the binomial coefficients, because there's no golden ratio in sight in that formula. And so I hope that this shows you a little bit of the power of generating functions. Now let me say something else about that, um, which is that very often, actually, the explicit formulas are really horrible. I mean, in this case, the explicit formula is not too bad. It's nice. But there are many problems where the explicit formula is horrible, but you have a generating function where, I mean, here what we did is go from the generating function to the explicit formula to the asymptotic formula. But very often what you can do is skip this and go from the, from, uh, from the generating function to the asymptotic format. Complex analysis knows how to do this very well. And in fact, you, you could just, you know, by, by talking about radiuses of, radii of convergence, you could have argued some, uh, something about the asymptotics of the Fibonacci numbers without any explicit formulas. Uh, so the point that I want to make is that that's when you actually want to bring in analysis. And it's very useful to do that when explicit formulas are not so useful. Very often you can go from generating function to asymptotic formula directly using complex analysis. Now, I want to go ahead and acknowledge that we're not going to do this in this class. It's very interesting. It's very useful. But out of the many things that we could have done in this class, I decided that this is not one we're going to cover. Um, but it's something that's very interesting, and if it's the kind of thing that interests you, you could take your project in this direction. And I can give you some pointers of great books that, uh, that talk about complex analytic methods in order to obtain asymptotic formulas in combinatorics. But you're not going to find it in Stanley's book either. Uh, everything there is done in terms of formal paradigms. Um, okay, so I think that's a that's a good place to stop. Uh, we'll continue next week, uh, and I just want to make sure that everybody knows. So I sent an email with all kinds of things. So there's a homework zero that's due tomorrow at midnight, and then there's the real first homework, which is due next Friday. The forum is there. The lec the lecture notes I'm about to post. So we're on basically. The, we're online. Okay. See you guys next week.